Good morning, everyone. It's funny, the Alleluia after the gospel is one of those things that when we stop doing it, we'll finally all be on board with it. <laughs> Such it is. Last week, I was at my annual physical, and in the exam room, the doctor had a cartoon pasted up on the wall. So I went over to take a look at it, and it was a picture of a patient saying to the doctor, I'm just here for a checkup, so there's no need for you to find anything. Well, I'm happy to say the doctor didn't find anything. Um, but after the physical, my doctor was telling me about his parish. And he said how in his parish, there were two priests. There's a pastor and there's a retired priest who lives there. And each week, they go back and forth between who gives the homily. One of them, he said, preaches about love each week, and he called it fluff. And the other, he said, has real substance. I did not tell him that I was talking about love this week. <laughs> but I probably should have said, love is not fluff. Love is hard. Love is hard because love does not gloss over the truth. Love has to be rooted in the truth because otherwise it's a lie. And love is hard because if you love someone and then they hurt you, you don't stop loving them, do you? That's why I'm sure that for most of us, the most harmful things that we've heard or experienced haven't come from people we don't know, but from those we do, from parents, spouses, children, siblings, and friends. Another reason why love is hard is because love is not passive. Love is a lot like faith, because it's not something you can have but not use. This is what the letter of St. James says. If a brother or sister has nothing to wear and has no food for the day, and one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and eat well, but you do not give them the necessities of the body, what good is it? So also faith of itself, if it does not have works, is dead. And as faith without works is dead, so love without works is dead. Now, for most of us, we live this in our ordinary relationships, in our families, among our friends, in our workplaces, in our classrooms. But from time to time, situations do arise that make greater demands on our love. You know, like when we see someone who's hurting or someone who's in a tough situation, and we know we could do something about it. Recently, I heard a story from one of our St. Vincent de Paul societies. They were telling me about a couple they had visited who had been married for over 40 years and had a whole host of health issues. They said that mounting medical expenses had put them in a precarious financial situation, and then their car broke down. But because of the support of many of you, they were able to help get those repairs made so that they could get to medical appointments and other things. You know, that is an example of love in action. And again, it wasn't just the love of the two folks who made the visit, but it included the love of all of you who make their work possible. In our gospel today, Jesus gives us both a commandment to love as well as an example of loving when it's hard. The setting for today's gospel is the Last Supper. So Jesus is at a sort of an intimate gathering with his closest collaborators, men who love Jesus deeply, but also men who are going to let him down. And the meal began with what was considered, with Jesus doing, what was considered to be the work of slaves, washing the dirty feet of people who walked down dusty roads in sandals. And then afterwards he said, as I have done for you, you also should do. And just to put this in context, just make this a little clearer, this isn't like the washing of the feet that we do on Holy Thursday. 
Because on Holy Thursday, most people wash their feet in advance. I'm told the women will often get pedicures. And then they even put this nice smelling stuff in the water to make it so much more pleasant. <laughs> That's not what happened here. For us though, I mean, most of us, Jesus is, isn't probably literally saying that you need to go wash people's feet. But I think what Jesus is saying is that we need to see no form of service is being beneath us. No form of service is being beneath us. And that's not always easy because the truest acts of love are those for which we get nothing in return. And then our, the gospel part that we read today, it began with the detail, Judas had left them. And then we know what happens after supper. After supper, Jesus would be arrested in the garden He'd be abandoned by his friends, he'd be denied by Peter, he'd be mocked, beat, and then he'd be crucified. And as we read in the gospel, Jesus said, my children, I will be with you only a little while longer. As God, Jesus knew everything that was going to happen, and yet he did it anyways. Because his love was not fluff. Jesus loved not because of any good feeling that he got, but because he always wanted what was best for the apostles, and he always wants what's best for you. No matter what you do, or no matter how undeserving you might be. You know, all of that is the background for what Jesus said next. I give you a new commandment. Love one another. Now, the commandment to love, strictly speaking, isn't new. It's found throughout the Old Testament in different ways. But what is new is the second part. As I have loved you, so you also should love one another. And I think the key word there is as. As I have loved you. Not with a little when it's easy, not when it's convenient, not when you get a good feeling in return, and not only for the people who deserve it, but with everything. Truly wanting what is the best for them, whatever it is that's really going to help them. And just to kind of you know, really drive the point home. Think of the person who bothers you the most. That's who Jesus is talking about. Or even think of someone who's hurt you. That's who Jesus is saying, you have to want what's best for them. A few months ago, I was talking with a parishioner who was sharing with me a, about a rough patch that he had went through. He said that his, his marriage had fallen apart. He had found himself in, in deep financial distress. And in his own words, he called it the low point of his life. And then in the midst of all of this going on, either somehow he got an article that, 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 that stuck in his mind. And in the article, it said that you should make it a point to do three good deeds a day. And he said that when he started being intentional about doing three good deeds a day, for him, it was a real turning point. Of course, his problems didn't go away overnight, and I'm sure new problems cropped up again, but his attitude changed. He found that he began to live less and less for himself and more and more for others. He said that some of the good deeds were small, like helping an elderly neighbor get their, their newspaper in the morning, but some of them were a lot bigger. For certain, the good deeds helped others, but they also helped him. He said I could share this story because since it helped him, he thought it might help others too. And I think he'd also say that maybe three is not a bottom limit, <laughs> not, an upper, not an upper limit. Okay, well, the final thought is this. 
while we don't love for what we get, we get so much when we do.